Hello and welcome back to the module analysis video where I get to have a cup of coffee with you and we get to analyze the search phase we've just gone through. I've given you the building block exercise to do and in the first phase of the 4S process, I've introduced you to the Google Sheet to record your viable products. You're gonna use this spreadsheet time and time again. I use the analogy of the house and how the house is built up through each of the four phases of the 4S process. In the mindset module, I talked about the search phase being the foundation of the house. In the foundation stage of your research, we're saying, am I able to sell this product? It doesn't matter how logical the product may be or how profitable it may be if you cannot sell it on Amazon. And that's really what we're talking about inside the search phase. We are applying the first filter and search has got a number of filters. Some people skip the foundation phase in their Amazon business and they try to put the roof on before anything else has been built yet. A lot of people have the wrong foundations. I've seen a lot of people with rules about things having to be small and light or they have to be a certain price or they have to be a certain this. Really, your foundation is about asking, can I sell the products that I'm researching on Amazon? Am I able to do it via FBA? And do I have the viability to actually make that particular sale on the Amazon platform? If I didn't have the product specifics to avoid, then we might say something like, I'm gonna sell a bleach product, which is a hazardous chemical. We can see that Amazon are selling this item. So if I didn't give you the item specifics to avoid, you might also assume you can sell this hazardous product. You might get to a point in time when you can't sell the bleach product. If I see people selling a product that has power with a plug and I tell you not to sell, this is an item specific to avoid in the search phase. Some people sell them and, and then they might say, I'm gonna send a pallet of that product to Europe from the US. Well, in Europe, there are different types of plugs. The point is, if you don't understand about the viability of a product in all markets, you can get into trouble when starting out as a beginner. Electrical products aren't a viable product in all countries because of the different plugs required. And I just want you to avoid complicated things like that and to simplify your process. I gave you the primary categories that are the best to research in and they are really easy for beginners to start in during the search phase of the 4S process. The, the search phase is not something that you should be rushing. You should be taking it step by step, entering products in the search tab on the spreadsheet. The first step is called viability. I explained that there are many categories that you cannot sell in straight away. We immediately remove those from our initial research. You may come back to them over time when you're more established, and you can then get approval to go into those particular categories. In the beginning, I want you to stick to the recommend categories because that's the best place for you to start. There are other categories that are possible once you're an established seller. I also mentioned the categories that are possible but require approval from Amazon. The beauty category um, is a very popular and a very competitive category on Amazon. If you come into this program with a preconceived idea to sell on a category like beauty, then you have a problem from the start. If, you, if you're gonna say, I'm going to sell beauty products and you know, you're saying to yourself, if I get approval, it's more difficult for other people to get into that category as well. And you, you might think that's a good thing you're gonna to have to get approval, which at the very start could prove to be a barrier that will narrow your focus. And I want you to research in multiple categories. You're gonna find out you know, more of what I call hidden gems inside all these different categories. And you'll be able to expand your research a lot further and this is gonna pay off in the long run. Some people ask me the question, so if I'm starting off my research with everybody else at the same point, am I gonna find exactly the same product? And the answer to that is no, and the reason is very simple. I like to use the analogy of a big tree when explaining the concept of categories and subcategories on Amazon. Now we all start our research on the trunk of the tree or the main categories. Then the tree starts to branch out and, and go into subcategories. You might go to the left and I might go to the right. Then you come to another branch or subcategory you might move off that branch, you might move on to another twig or sub subcategory. And at the very end, you might find yourself on a leaf, which in this example is a product. You could be around the other side of the Amazon tree to me and the tree has millions of leaves or products on it. 
So to actually find yourself on the same product as somebody else is highly, highly unusual. We are researching in these different recommended categories. So even at the very start, you, you may not be on the same trunk or even the same tree as somebody else. Coming back to the beauty category and categories requiring approval from Amazon, the reason that they require approval is because the type of product that's in there is relatively sensitive. You might put things on your skin or they might be ingestible like vitamins and supplements. When you're selling a product like a beauty product, you've got to go and get all these special requirements and special certifications and that's going to slow down your launch time. It's also potentially going to cost you a lot of money. It's going to give you a feeling that this is really difficult because Amazon puts things in place to prevent people from coming in and just selling any old cream to anybody because obviously it's dangerous. Amazon have got to protect consumers, so whenever you have consumer protection, you have government departments involved. So I just want you to think about the DIRT products that are dull and boring. The same thing applies for toys and games. Because Amazon will put on certain restrictions at times of the year, like the holiday season, if you're starting off in these categories, you're not going to be allowed to sell there. Simply because Amazon doesn't know you, they don't know whether your products, which are more than likely for children, have, have got the certifications, or whether you're going to be able to deliver in time, which is highly important at this time of the year. That's why those categories can be done eventually. But it's not something I recommend at the very start, because there are lots of other simple and easy categories on the list that I teach you about. So really, there's no reason to actually be looking at any others in the beginning. Not only do we have the main categories, but we've got subcategories and sub subcategories to search in and find viable products. We are also going to be selling products in more than one country. That means that with the same amount of work, we're going to access more customers in more places. If we only think about selling in one country, we restrict ourselves to a certain population. But we have so many more customers to sell our products to in the different Amazon countries. If you get involved in things like shoes and clothing, the amount of problems you're going to have there with sizes and keeping sizes in stock and then having sizes that nobody buys, you know, it's just not worth it. I spoke about avoiding preconceived ideas in the mindset module. So if you have any preconceived idea of selling in one of these categories, please remove that preconceived idea and start again. Many of the item specifics to avoid are quite obvious. Um, one time I sold a product in the past that you wouldn't have said it was a hazardous product, but I started to sell it and all of a sudden, boom, it was considered hazardous. Amazon sometimes will alter different things because they make the rules on their platform. Amazon are able to sell certain items because it's their playground. Therefore, just looking and seeing Amazon selling a product doesn't mean you can sell it too. You need to use the item specifics to avoid and apply them to the letter of the law in the beginning. With the item specific about electrical or battery, there's a couple of good reasons for this. I've already mentioned the plug scenario where if you've got an item which needs to be plugged into the wall, you've got you know, different plugs in America and than you do in the UK. Um, products that have battery power or solar power are going to have more inner workings than those products. And, and they do have a natural fault rate. Uh, we want to stay away from that type of product. We want to have a dull, boring item. Now, some of Amazon's rules may change as time goes on, and that's just a fact of life. So one of the things to be aware of is everything in the program I have is accurate. However, there are times when Amazon will change things. We will change with that, but please be, you know, please keep an eye on these sort of things because it's in your best interest to do this. Certain weight bands may change or certain sizing bands may change. The point is to start looking at what Amazon is telling you because at the end of the day, they're the parent in this whole relationship. One thing that people can get hung up on in the item specifics to avoid is the sub $7 rule. If you've done the research and looked at a product under $7, the reason why I discourage that is because the vast majority of Amazon's fees are percentages based on the sale price of the product. Now there's a, a base fee whenever we sell something using FBA and the fee charge can make it very difficult for the sub $7 product to be profitable. Whenever you're doing research on a product that is sub $7, ask yourself, is there the option that I could sell more than one of that product? Is it logical to sell two of those in the one pack? Is it logical that a consumer will buy more than one of those at the same time? Now a good example is a light bulb. 
a consumer may buy one light bulb to replace a broken one that's blown, but also would it make sense for them to buy a pack of light bulbs so that they can have them in their house? Start thinking about that, and if you think it is the case, then start thinking about the pack size. When you go through the 4S process sequentially, like I've set it out for you, you're gonna get the best results possibly because the idea here is to build a big list of viable products, and we will whittle them down in the later modules. I talk in the mindset module about data is king, and this is what we're building here in the search phase. We're building a list of data, and that data is about the products that are viable to sell on Amazon. The products that you have inside your 4S product spreadsheet are now viable because they don't have any, anything specific to avoid. They are in you know, certain categories that are inside the BSR, which means they're now viable for you to move forward with. You do not need to overthink this in terms of going into the next module. You need to build this list of viable products starting from the top 100. It's highly unlikely that you're gonna find a product that you end up selling inside the top 100. So people then say, well, why do we start here? And the reason is very simple. I have to give you a starting point. You haven't done research like this before, so I've, I've got to start you somewhere. You're gonna start our journey somewhere, and that's in the top 100. And so, you know, you've just got to get used to the system. You need to get used to finding the ASINs, the BSRs, understand the way the categories operate, learn about the subcategories. And as you move on, you know, that's where you'll start to find more and more of these hidden gems. It's about learning what works in a category, what is selling right now, and what are the best selling products in that category. That then starts to give you some knowledge that you're going to be able to use to, uh, you know, utilize as you go forward because then, Let's say in the future you go to a trade show and you're walking around and you're seeing all these different types of products. Well, the mistake a lot of people would make is they just go there, they have no idea about anything. They go there and they find a product that they like and obviously you know, you're going through this program, you know that that's crazy. Who cares if you like it or not? It's all about whether or not people are buying it. You know, is it in demand? And can we create a better version or a better offer in the Amazon market, etc.? I think the whole point of this you know, you could go to that trade show in the future knowing what you know about categories. You could uh, go and see a product. Uh, I know they're pretty good. And you can say to yourself, I'll make a note of that and I'll run this through the 4S spreadsheet to see if it's viable. I'll cover more advanced research processes in the program in later modules. But here, I just want you to become a great business owner, not just somebody who follows a couple of rules and hopes that the product's gonna work. I want you to know the categories and if, you just start using special software or whatever, you're, you're gonna be using the same parameters that everybody else is using. You're gonna find what everybody else is finding. You're not gonna learn anything about these categories whatsoever because you're just seeing the odd product here and there. Whereas as you start to look through, everything starts to connect and you start to see trends and patterns in certain categories and that's what I think is a really valuable learning experience. You're also building a research system for yourself now. You're actually going through a process, a strategy that I've set out here for you. And I don't want you to start second guessing yourself about what's gonna happen next. Just follow through what I've actually talked about inside this search phase part of the 4S product process. Get your search phase done. Get as many results as you can according to the building block and then move forward. You're gonna come back here. This is not the last time that you're gonna be in search phase. You're gonna be in search phase forever in your business because you're gonna to wanna to keep building this search pipeline. It becomes a very important part of your business having a pipeline of new products. You're not just gonna do 100 products here and never come back because you wanna have this constant thread of research coming back and feeding more and more products into your business. It really is key and you're gonna see that as you progress into later modules of the 4S process that the search phase is so important because products are gonna get knocked out naturally in the next phases. That's just the way it is. Now, I wanna talk about non-packable items. It's about products with an odd shape that we wanna disregard. Things like a lampshade is an example I used in the training video. Whenever we're talking about packaging, we have to go within Amazon's guidelines. Everything has to come inside either a box or a bag, which has a label on the outside of it. We can't just send Amazon items that are loose and stacked up. If something is an odd shape, and by odd shape, I mean when it's stacked in the package, you know, if it's an odd shape, it's not gonna stack very easily. It's not gonna go into 
a box of multiple units of that particular product very easily. So now I wanna to talk to you about replacement parts. If you've got a replacement part for a specific product that comes from a particular manufacturer, then you're inherently linked to that particular manufacturer's product. If that particular manufacturer went off the market because the parent company who controlled that product withdrew it, then you'd not be able to sell again. That's why we want to avoid replacement parts. If you're looking at something which is universal to a specific type of product, then that's completely different. Now I want to talk about IP infringement, intellectual property or IP. The key concept I'm teaching here is if you take the example of a Disney lunchbox with Disney characters on it, you would know that there's going to be a licensing issue there. And you're going to have to get you know, permission from Disney to be able to produce that item and sell it. Also, there are other things to be aware of like Hoover items or Velcro items. These things can either be copyrighted or they can be trademarked as well. And we've, we've got to be aware that if we're using Velcro, we can't say Velcro in the Amazon title. You may say, well, how do I know if it's patented? The vast majority of patented items are going to be very logical to look at and see, especially if they've got a brand on it such as Disney. If anybody has a patented product, they will generally say that it's patented because they're going to want to scare people away from selling the item. Because we have an, in, an inexhaustible list of products to go and research, we don't need to focus on one particular product. Whenever it comes to IP, if you have even the slightest inkling that it could involve an IP infringement, move on, because it's not worth going down that path and spending a lot of time on it. Rather than spending a lot of time and digging around to find out these things, just simply move on. What I'm talking about here keeps relating back to the DIRT products. Whenever we're looking at the viability of a product in the search phase, we need to ask, is this item dull and boring? Now, the BSR or bestseller rank. I gave you the BSR limits. I've explained in this module the reason why we use BSRs. It's quite simply to see if it's a viable product. We're talking about viability here in this module. And the reason why I give that limit on BSRs is so that we know that a product is viable in terms of the sales volume. I want something that can sell five a day. That's what I'm talking about with the rule of five. I've given you a limit that you can work with so that you know where five a day roughly is. I do say roughly, and I mean roughly because of, at times whenever I say your limit is 20,000, I get asked the question, so what about 20,001? What about 20,500? The answer is yes, that is viable, um, and that's why we have a grey area of about 20%. So if you see something that's sitting around a grey area, can you improve it? Can you slightly improve the product sales? Well, of course you can, but also as time progresses, maybe that product increases in sales or would you be happy to sell four of those a day as opposed to five a day? And well, of course you would. You're recording items in the spreadsheet that fall within the BSR limit, and we're just looking at individual products right now. When we go into the later phases of the 4S process, you will likely see that there are similar products selling, and maybe you didn't see the BSR behind that product. And for whatever reason, that product might be sitting in a different category. A product that you may expect to be in a certain category may actually be listed in a different category. And that's just the way Amazon's catalog is because people who are selling, they have the option to list the product in a category. So it's up to them where it sits. Now, Amazon over time, of course, will correct things. So you may find that a product that you expect to see in home and garden is actually sitting in automotive. In this search phase, the first thing you're gonna do is of course, choose the country where you're gonna research in. Now, I get asked, where do I start? And I say, start primarily in the country that you're gonna sell. That's more than likely gonna be the US or the UK. If you do intend to, first of all, sell in the US, then start researching there. But also don't confine yourself because you can research in the UK too. It's always good to get to become, you know, get yourself aware of these other sites because the UK is slightly different. There is a slightly different use of the English language in America and the UK. There's a metric system and there's an imperial system of weights and measurements. So it's always good to study both sides so that you can see the small differences. Also, sometimes you get categories uh, which are called slightly different things. So it's good to explore different Amazon sites. I sometimes get the question, I don't live in the US or the UK, so where do I start? And really, you know, I say it's up to you. I cannot tell you what to do. 
Picking one is the only real answer to that question. It really comes down more to just picking a country and getting started. Don't let anything hold you back like taxes or setting up companies or any of this complicated stuff. My advice is just pick a country and get started. I also taught in the mindset module about selling in multiple countries. So I would expand your product once it gets into stock in the first market to other Amazon markets. Now that's only possible when you do that mixed research in both the US and the UK. Whenever you're going through the search phase, it's about creating a list. You're not going to find items in the top 100. You're going to be moving beyond that BSR. So you know once, once you've got to the end of a category, you know, you're going into a subcategory, then you're going into a sub-subcategory, and just continually drilling down deeper and deeper and deeper into a category, noting down opportunities all the time, and really that is the search phase process. It's a very scientific part of the process. There's not a whole lot of art involved in the search phase. There may be the odd thing where you're thinking, okay, well, is that an odd shape? But that's about it. It's very simple, it's very logical, it's all about finding viability. In later modules, we look at competition, and we're going to look at where there are opportunities to improve the products. You can't even begin to think about that right now until you've made a, a search phase list. We then move into the shortlist phase, and then we'll move on and on. And at the end of the process, we're going to find some products to sell on Amazon. Remember, the more upfront work you do right now, the bigger reward will, you know, will be for you in the long run because you're going to have plenty of opportunities. You're not going to be obsessed with a product as you're bringing it through the 4S process. And ultimately, this is a perpetual system. You're gonna keep on rinsing and repeating. More and more opportunities are gonna become available to you all the time as more products become launched globally on Amazon. So that's it now, and I'll see you in the next module.